We're going to start with a really basic question today, and that is, if you were unable to count past three, how do you know that the number of squares that I've drawn here is the same as the number of triangles that I've drawn here? So obviously we can all count past three, so we can see that the number of squares here is four, the number of triangles is four, and four equals four, so we know that there are the same number of squares and triangles. But let's suppose that you couldn't count past three. How would you determine that this is the same number of objects as this? So the way to do it is to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of squares to the set of triangles. So that's just a really fancy way of matching each square with exactly one triangle. So I moved my pictures of squares and triangles over here so that we can try this matching procedure. Well, maybe we would match this square with this triangle. So that, we, that means we've matched this square with exactly one triangle. We could match maybe this square with this triangle. So again, we've matched this square with this triangle, and then we could keep going. So maybe we would match this one and this one, and this one and this one. So we've done our goal. We have matched all of these squares with exactly one triangle, which means we have shown that the number of squares up here is the same thing as the number of triangles down here without counting. So this is like pretty trivial because we can obviously count to four, but the real power of this is to show that two infinite sets have the same size. Okay, so let's get some of that information on the board. So a nice way of summarizing what we built up on the last board is as follows. So let's suppose that A and B are sets. And so here they could be any sets. In comparison with what we just looked at, A could be the set of all of those squares. So we've got four squares inside of that set. And B could be the set of these four triangles. So again, we've got four triangles within this set. Then, if we can match each A in A with exactly one B in B, and every element of B is matched exactly once, then we say there is a bijection F from A to B. Furthermore, F evaluated at A is equal to B if A is matched with B. So this function F is describing the matching. So for instance, if our matching goes like this, let's say maybe this first one is matched with this first one, this second one is matched with this second one, third one, and then this third one is matched with this second one, and then finally the fourth is, ma is matched with the fourth, then we would say that f of this square was equal to this square. And furthermore, f of this square was equal to this square, and so on and so forth. So this is a description of this function here. It's a mapping from this set A to this set B. But now let's look at a really interesting example where we use this idea over here to instead of showing that two four element sets are the same, we show two sets with infinitely many elements have the same number of elements. Okay, so let's maybe clean up this side of the board and we'll get going. Okay, so for our example, we'll show that the set of natural numbers and the set of integers has the same number of elements. Even though there's infinitely many elements in each, we can show they have the same number of elements by making one of these bijections like we described over here. Okay, so let's start by listing out all the natural numbers. Let's recall that that means the positive integers, in other words, the positive whole numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then so on and so forth. I just put dot, dot, dot here. And now we could haphazardly just write the integers, making sure we never list one more than once, but I think we should do this in some sort of systematic way. So let's maybe work out from what I'll call the middle, which is the number zero. So working out from the middle, we'll start at zero, then we'll go one minus one, and then we'll go two minus two, three minus three, four minus four, and then so on and so forth. So in other words, we have defined a function that takes n to z, and we know the first couple of values of it. 
So we know f of 1 is equal to 0, f of 2 is equal to 1, f of 3 is equal to negative 1, f of 4 is equal to 2, and then so on and so forth. And now I think with some words, you could argue that this is going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. In other words, a matching or a bijection like described over here. But I always like to have functions be formulas whenever possible. And in fact, there is a formula that describes this. So let's define this function as follows. So f evaluated at n, where n is any natural number, will be minus 1 to the n times 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 all over 4. OK, so let's look at this. And there's actually a few things to check. We first need to check that this indeed always gives us an integer. We really need to check that here because we have a 4 in the denominator. It's possible that this would not give us an integer. Then we need to show that we're able to achieve every integer exactly one time. OK, so let's maybe move this up and then we'll check those properties. OK, so on the last board we wrote the following formula down and we've got three things to check to make sure that we have a so-called bijection. First, we need to check that we indeed land inside of the integers. So we can perform this type of operation for any natural number, but because we've got that four in the denominator, it's not super clear immediately that we land within the integers, but let's check that. So here I've written that as number one, and we're gonna break this into two cases. So let's say our first case, if n is even, but if n is even, we can write n as 2k, where k is a natural number. So in other words, it's like 2, 4, 6, 8, so on and so forth. But now let's check this. f evaluated at n is the same thing as f evaluated at 2k, which is minus 1 to the 2k. And then we'll have 4k minus 1 plus 1 all over 4. But minus 1 to the 2k is plus 1 because that's an even number. Then we have 4k minus 1 plus 1. That leaves us with 4k over 4, which is just equal to k. OK, so that's good. That's definitely a natural number because of how we started. So let's move on to our second case. So our second case is if n is odd. Let's notice that if n is odd, that means n is equal to 2k minus 1, where k is a natural number. So that would be like 1, 3, 5, so on and so forth. Now let's check f evaluated at n, which is f evaluated at 2k minus 1, which is minus 1 to the 2k minus 1. And then we have 4k minus 2 minus 1 plus 1 all over 4. So we have something like that. OK, so that's from distributing this 2 in the definition of f through to this 2k minus 1. But now notice since 2k minus 1 is odd, if we raise minus 1 to an odd number, we get a negative number. So that means this numerator will turn into minus 4k plus 4. That's because these two will change signs. So we'll have plus 3 plus 4 all over 4. But let's notice that that's minus k plus 1, which is most definitely an integer. So in this case, we got a natural number out. Over there, we got an integer out. But really, we only needed to get an integer. So since the natural numbers form a subset of the integers, we're good to go in either case, which means we have proved that this first condition holds. OK, let's move on to this second condition. So now let's move on to the second condition, which says if f of m equals f of n, then n is equal to n. So this is more properly known as injectivity. And it has to do with this matched exactly once component of our kind of loose definition over here. OK, so let's see how we might do this. So let's start by supposing that we have natural numbers m and n with f evaluated at m is the same thing as f evaluated at n, and we want to end with m is equal to n. OK, so let's apply our formula. That means minus 1 to the m, 2m minus 1 plus 1 is the same thing over 4, 
is the same thing as minus one to the n, 2n minus one plus one all over four. We can multiply both sides by four to get rid of the fours, and then we can subtract one to get rid of these plus ones, and that quickly leaves us with minus one to the m, 2m minus one equals minus one to the n times 2n minus one. So now let's notice this, this 2m minus one term is always positive. So we know that because m is coming from the natural numbers. Furthermore, this 2n minus one term is also always positive which means the only thing contributing to the sign on either side of the equation is this minus one to the m and this minus one to the n. So that means those have to be equal. So again, if they were not equal, if this was positive and then this minus one to the n was negative, then that means that this would have to be positive and this would have to be negative, but that's impossible because those two terms are always positive like we just said. Okay, so that means we can cancel this from both sides of the equation, again, because they're equal, and then we get 2m minus one equals 2n minus one, which can very quickly be reduced to m equals n, which is exactly what we needed for this second condition to hold. Okay, good. So now let's move on to this third condition. Now we're moving on to this third condition that says for all b and z, we have an n and n, so in other words, a natural number such that f evaluated at n is b. So this again has to do with this every element of b is matched exactly once. So what we did up here showed that it can't be matched more than once. What we're showing here is that it can't be matched zero times. So if it can't be matched more than once, it can't be matched zero times, it has to be matched exactly once. So that's what we're getting at here. Okay, so now we're gonna split this into two cases. So let's start by supposing that we have an integer b, just like we have here, and now we wanna construct an n that gets mapped onto the b. Like I said, this is gonna be inspired by our calculation in this first part. So this is gonna break down into two cases. So our first case is that b is positive. So if b is bigger than or equal to one, let's notice that if we set n equal to 2b, we have f evaluated at n is f evaluated at 2b, which is equal to negative one to the 2b. And then we have 4b minus one plus one. This is all over four. That becomes 4b over four, which is equal to b. So we found a so-called pre-image for our element b in the case where b is positive. You might say, well, how did we come up with this? Again, that's inspired by what we saw in our calculation for part one. Okay, so now let's move on to case two. And that case is if b is less than or equal to zero. So here we had b is less than zero. Here b is less than or equal to zero. But notice if b is less than or equal to zero, then we can write b as one minus k for some natural number k. So notice zero can be rewritten as one minus one, negative one can be written as one minus two, so on and so forth. Now, let's set n equal to two k minus one and see what happens. So we have f evaluated at n is the same thing as f evaluated at two k minus one, but that's gonna be minus one to the two k minus one. And then we have 4k minus 2 minus 1 plus 1 all over 4. But that's similar to what we had before. If you recall, that simplified to 1 minus k before. I think we wrote that as minus k plus 1 before, but it's the same. But 1 minus k was equal to our b. So in this case, we also found a so-called pre-image for our element b. It was n equals 2k minus 1. So these three things together show that indeed we do have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers or and the integers. 
In other words, we have shown they have the same number of elements, obviously without being able to count all of the elements because there are infinitely many elements. And that's a good place to stop.